I'm in the 16 lot. What do you got? There's supposedly a male party in a black vehicle parked at the pumps, possibly unconscious. Narcan was administered and he's alert now. Twenty by Connecticut ID when you're ready. Hey to a cold tester car. HC eighty three. You start for an overdose. Wolf Hebron Road. Hey to a cold tester car. Nine one one, where's your emergency? My sister's good dad, and she's gone. She overdosed. I just found her. Okay, well, she's not breathing? No, she's cold. Okay. All right, I'll get somebody right over there, okay? Thank you. How Connecticut has gotten to this a point, and our nation has gotten to the point of, a, of, a, of an opioid epidemic that really can be characterized as an epidemic, um, that is the critical uh, uh, question, and the critical word is epidemic uh, in Connecticut and nationwide. It is a public health crisis. There's serious, serious uh, 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 occurrences. Uh, every single day in the, in the United States. We have over 100 Americans uh, who die every uh, a, a day from overdoses, uh, and that outnumbers the deaths, I understand it, from gunshot wounds and from automobile accidents. There is no age, gender. It is across the board that we are looking at young people, adults, who are becoming addicted uh, through through opioids. I lived with my mom when I was like first born, and my grandmother. Um, my dad came and visited because my nana wasn't my nana wasn't really a fan of him, and <clears throat> for a year, like he'd come and visit. We lived in Cromwell. Uh, it wasn't the best neighborhood, definitely, but it was like what we were used to. We grew up in those places. Then when I was two, he got arrested and was sent to jail. And I didn't find out this until I was about 10 years old and it wasn't, I wasn't even supposed to find out because he didn't tell me, but I found out he was arrested for gang, being in a gang and killing somebody. It wasn't really something you should tell a 10-year-old, so I kind of understand why I wasn't supposed to find out. So my mom was used to hanging out with like some of the rougher people, so I think just she liked it. My mom, I knew she drank alcohol a lot just because it was around the house. I'd never seen her like using drugs at home, she'd always drink at home, but at like friends' houses she'd be smoking like joints and they'd have heroin and uh, crack, it was, it was kind of like the normal thing. The moment my mom died, uh, that was, I wasn't really there for like, she had gotten sick while I was in Florida and she had pneumonia that, well that's what I was told, she had pneumonia. So I was worried about her while I was in Florida, and by the time I'd come back, she was in the hospital. Like, things had gotten more complicated. She was hooked up to all other kinds of machines and stuff. And then it just started getting worse, but I didn't know, because I was, I was only 11. I didn't know what like the floors of hospitals meant, that every time you went higher, it would get worse. Or So when she started, when she got hooked up to less machines, I thought she was getting better but apparently she was in hospice. I didn't know hospice was equal to basically they're gonna die. 
So I, when I saw, I saw her the day before she died, she couldn't talk. She had the thing down her, like the mask and the thing down her throat. And I wasn't really like sure. So I, was, I just talked to her. I talked to her, I held her hand. She was yellow at this time because her, her, her liver was dying or was failing. So I told her I loved her and that I would see her tomorrow because I was planning on visiting again. But she whispered to me that she loved me and that was the last time I saw my mom. Yeah. I had moved to East Hampton after my mom had passed away to live with my grandmother. I left school multiple times just from freaking out. So I had no friends. Middle school is like weird where you already have like, this is the popular group, this is the band people. I came in, I was depressed. I, I had just lost my mom, I didn't know what to do. No one really wanted to talk to me, except for, um, I guess you'd call them the druggies in school. I didn't know at the time that they did that, but they asked me to hang out, and I was like, yeah, oh my gosh, I, I'll have friends. I sat with them, and that was the beginning of my, my adventure with drugs. The first thing I ever tried was um, pills, because I had seen them, like I, I thought they were like um, the medicine you take like for headaches and stuff. I'm like, okay, it's just gonna be a bunch of that kind of stuff. And they said it was gonna feel good. It was gonna make me like less sad all the time and more like happy and, or not even happy, just not feel all down. So I was like, okay. And so they handed me something. I don't remember, but. I remember, mm, it wasn't like right there it started, but it, after a while it just started feeling like, oh my gosh, it's, I don't feel like complete crap anymore. I don't feel like I have to think about my mom being dead and everything in life. I tried other things besides pills, but nothing like made me as happy as pills did. Like I tried like, hmm. I did try um, crack, and it was, uh, it just wasn't the same. It didn't make me feel as like good, and ah. And after that, it just was a regular thing. And I had access to pills because I started going to the doctors for depression and anxiety. So I was able to bring things to get more, to get different kinds, to trade with people or mm. it was a it was an adventure uh, so I've tried heroin I think it was one of my friend's older brothers he is visiting he was visiting from for spring break or some break from campus but he had gotten a hold of heroin uh, from parties that they've gone to and he's like he introduced it to his brother who became addicted to it and he's he knew he could get more. He, he offered me some. And I was always, I was like, I wanted to fit in. I wanted to be cool. I wanted to, I, my big thing was I wanted to belong. And he's like, you should try it. You should try it. I'm like, okay, I'll try it. And I'm, I'm up for anything. And I tried it. I became more like secretive. Like I would tell Nana I was going, my Nana, I was hanging out with like some friends down the street. Uh, we were just gonna go watch a movie or something. So I started like lying to my Nana, which I hated lying, I I was bad at it. But she also didn't really like ask much. I don't think she was used to like dealing with teenagers since she hadn't raised one in a while. So she was like, oh, okay. If I said I was going to hang out with friends, she wouldn't ask any more questions. 
Um, so I didn't really, the lying thing wasn't that hard. I could say, oh, I'm just gonna go sleep over a friend's house and actually be at a party. I'd be like, they'll drive me home in the morning. So many times I'd woken up in places I didn't even know. <laughs> I drank, I drank all the time with, uh Most sneaking was the issue in school. My schoolwork started failing. My Nana didn't understand why I wasn't studying well. She thought it was because of the depression, which I think a part of it was, but it's also just because I couldn't focus. I couldn't, I, w I was freaking out. I'd pull out my hair and I'd scratch and my hands were constantly shaking. I think my rock bottom was definitely, I woke up, I was at a party and I woke up, I was passed out. And when you wake up just after drugs and anything you, alcohol, oh, so many different things were like happening in my head to the point where it was like pounding, but not, and it was like a numb, a numbness, but you could still feel pain. I don't, oh, it's so, so hard to explain in like words, but I woke up and I was, I was all alone. There were, there were lights outside. It wasn't morning, like the, it was like the early morning. Ooh, bug. It was like the early mornings of the night, like, oh, the early morning of the night. 4 a.m. where it's still dark out. And there were lights flashing. And I was all alone in the, this house that I didn't know was a thing. So I get up and I see cops outside. They're looking for people and bushes and trees. And I realized like the people that I called friends, the people that I thought I belonged with, left me behind. They didn't care that I was passed out, probably gonna get in trouble, maybe even arrested. There were pills on the floor, needles. I, if I hadn't left and gotten out of there the time I did through the back door, I could be in juvie, in a rehab, and not rehab, like an institution. They, that's when I was like, oh my gosh. They're not friends. They, they care about getting the next high, same as I did. But I thought, I thought I belonged. I thought I was someone. ambition in life as a kid was um, to be a vet. Um, I wanted to do well, I wanted to have a family. Um, I always liked living in a small town in the country. You know, I like living out here um, with the horses and everything and having the animals. I want to have my own farm. You know, I either wanted to be a vet or a riding instructor. I was very much a tomboy when I was a kid. I, I take home, you know, huge snapping turtles by their tail or, you know, a bunch of frogs, whatever I could catch. I went to Yukon for animal science with uh, equine focus. Um, while I was there, I uh, was on the equestrian team. So a lot of the time was showing and riding and taking lessons. Um, and then we had classes. The people that were there, like the frats, there was a lot of frat boys and stuff, and I think that um, I wasn't big into that. So I hung out with a lot more of uh, either the people from the agriculture part of it or um, my friends from high school. After I went to college and stuff, I came home. I was working as a riding instructor. Um, it didn't end up working out. Um, 
And, you know, I started working in marketing and uh, other jobs like that. And then uh, eventually I was a um, residential counselor for, for kids, um, for boys between uh, 13 and 18 that were there for either DCF orders or judicial orders. Um, and then I got pregnant with uh, my daughter's father. First had the C-section. I was prescribed Percocet five milligrams. To most normal people, that would be a high dose. I mean, there was just such this big change in my life. There was a lot going on. I think I had a lot of postpartum depression. I think it's something that when I first got it, it, it also made me happy. It was kind of like a trigger, I think. So when I first got it, I realized that it kind of took everything away too. In 2013, healthcare providers wrote 259 million prescriptions for opioid pain, pain relievers. Um, uh, this is extraordinary. was my daughter's father who started me and who offered it to me. And there's no way to really tell the rest of the story without telling that. And I'm sure he's fine with it because he's clean now too. But, um, and I didn't realize, I guess he had been really on and off with it and been hiding it from me for the whole time we had been together. He'd really been using off and on with it. Um, uh, Percocet. Percocet, 30 milligrams, um, oxycodone, those type of pills. Well, just in the beginning, you know, we would do it every once in a while. You know, it was often, um, you know, he would bring it home, and even then I had to cut it in little pieces, because even then it was way too strong for me. And it just became something that was habit, you know, it was something I expected every day when I got home or he got home. You know, I think then it just over time it became more and more often that we were doing it. And still, at that point, I didn't know that it was an addiction. I was never taught anything about addiction, so I thought it was just something I could do, and it wasn't gonna, you know, affect me. I wasn't gonna get addicted to it. I wasn't, you know, it wasn't gonna be around all the time. I was having a lot of joint pain and muscle pain. Um, that's how it first started. It gravitated more over time once I knew about addiction and knew that I was addicted to these pills. When I wouldn't have it, it would gravitate towards, you know, um, not sleeping. And that was a lot of time anyways because, you know, it got that I had such a hollow tolerance that I was hardly sleeping anyways. And when I was doing it, I wasn't getting high anymore anyways. And uh, most of the day until I got it, I. You know, I had muscle pain, I wasn't sleeping, and I had a lot of anxiety. And um, just mentally, your mind changes a lot. Um, you know, you get the sweats, and, and you don't want to do anything but lay in bed all day, even though you can't sleep. So over time, I think it just made me like a, a very empty person. I didn't care about anybody. I didn't care even about the people closest to me. Um, I was very just empty. I lost my horses, you know, we lost our house, I lost my best friend, she, you know, 15 years, she stopped talking to me, that was really hard, and then my daughter wasn't around as much, you know, I didn't get to live with my daughter anymore. Once me and my daughter's father and I weren't, you know, together anymore, and able to do all this stuff together, um, there was nothing else that I could get because these were all his connections and stuff. So I had to go to that in order to still get what I needed and it turned out that it was better, you know, I felt better and um, I would get more high at the time that I started. So it was the loss of the horses, the loss of your daughter. Yeah, I, I mean. The loss, all of that led to the graduation to heroin. Yeah, I mean, I think all of that, the pain from all of that, and not really, I didn't feel like I had really any support. There was nowhere I could really go. Nobody really wanted me to come home and, and live with them. I mean, they had tried, but I still continued using. I mean, 
um, any addict over time, you know, loses a lot of stuff in their life. Um, you know, I lost all that and, uh, you know, and then I was dealing with feeling really crappy and then mentally you, you lose a lot as well and you become kind of a empty person or an angry person and it's just, it gets to that point where you, you hit bottom and you kind of have to make this decision. What was your rock bottom? I think my rock bottom was, you know, I was on pain management and I was at one point and I was getting these pills from this doctor and what I was doing was, was I was selling those pills to get money and um, he had cut me not off because I got in an accident and so I had no more money left. Being homeless is very difficult, you know, um, you have to stay at friends' houses or anything like that, and it's just scary, especially for a woman, because, you know, it's, it's this danger aspect of it, and, you know, I mean, I was lucky I never ended up um, selling my body or doing anything like that, but there's other women that do in order, you know, because they have to. I mean, it came upon me that I needed to get help. Um, I needed the support from somewhere. My name is David Mucci. I'm an emergency room physician and I am boarded in by the American College of Emergency Physicians. I have been an emergency room physician since 1983, and daily we see a tremendous problem with patients addicted to opioids. The demographic of patients that come into the ER with, addi with addiction symptoms is across the board. I see uh, homeless patients that don't have two nickels to rub together that will scrape and get whatever money they can to buy their narcotics. I see middle class people, patients, that work two jobs to make ends meet that are addicted. I see the one percenters that come in and they've gotten into a car accident or have back pain and they're addicted. It is across the board. It's not one socioeconomic group. It's not one religion. It's not one um, 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 color, creed, or race. It is an epidemic across the entire breadth of society. The patients that come in the ER with overdose dose issues are, are categorized into IV drug users, um, s s smokers, other patients will come in from um, a opiate ingestion, uh, either by you know mucous membrane they will crush the oxys and snort it, or they'll take a, a, a large dose of oxys, Percocet, Vicodin, Dilaudids, and and they'll mix it with alcohol or or a Valium in their their uh, oral overdose. That's part of the, the evaluation in the physical exam. When a patient comes in from an overdose, there is multiple levels. Usually, if they have track marks in their arms, it's heroin. And we're seeing a lot of heroin mixed with fentanyl. And a lot of deaths from that because fentanyl is very potent. Initially, some patients are not opioid dependent. They will come in with an injury, and unfortunately, we feel that we are doing the good thing, making them comfortable, making them happy, and we give them uh, narcotics. Then we send them out with prescriptions because we don't want our patients to be uncomfortable. The, the narcotics that are used are highly um, uh, addictive, and then they come back, they're still in pain, and physicians don't want them to be uncomfortable and they give them more narcotics and the untoward effect is 
we end up addicting them. If they have broken bones, if they have terminal cancer, those are different stories. Those patients in Compassionate, you have to treat them. But there are a lot of people that, a lot of patients that come in with this chronic pain syndrome. And I tell them point blank, I don't treat chronic pain. I'm an emergency room physician. Um, that's not held with a lot of my colleagues and I'm not putting blame on them. Everyone has a different way that they practice medicine. Well, five years ago, I had a patient, two patients come in. I had this yeah, 19, 20 year old male come in on a stretcher called 911. He had a little bit of a chip nail that the nail got pulled up. Now, I've pulled a nail, it hurts. I wrap it, I take Motrin. He calls 911. He was in the triage area, yelling and screaming and carrying on that he needed IV Dilaudid. Dilaudid is a very powerful opioid and basically eight to 10 milligrams of morphine equals one milligram of Dilaudid. So I hear this commotion, I go out there, and I see this other patient, a little bit older than me, and his fingers, his hands wrapped up in a towel and it's all bloody. I look at the kid, I look at him and say, I'm gonna go speak to this, you know, elderly gentleman my age, so, I, <laughs> um, uh, nice middle-aged gentleman. And I asked him, what's wrong? And he unwrapped it and his index finger was ripped off mid-finger. And I asked him, what happened? Uh, I was sawing, you know, electric saw, and I cut it off. I said, well, do you need something for pain? That looks uncomfortable. He looked at me and said, young man, I was his age, <laughs> young man, I went through Vietnam and I was shot twice. He said, this is nothing. Give me a little Motrin. And then he looked and he said, what's wrong with that kid? You know, that's how, how ridiculous it is. Here's a guy who had ripped part of his finger off saying, I'm fine. Here's a kid who had kind of cracked his nail screaming, but because he's saying, I have 20 out of 10 pain, which is ridiculous, everyone's paying attention to him because his pain score is at the high end. And we have the ability to look up, and a lot of patients don't realize this. If I want to, I can look up every prescription that a patient has filled in Connecticut and where they've been filled. So I had a patient come in last year. In a six month period, he had filled, and prescription pharmacies had filled them, 8,760 milligram oxys. In, an eight, in, in a, um, in an, in a six-month period. And there's no way this person was taking all of them, because that would be taking one pill about every five minutes while awake, if he was awake for 18 hours. So he's clearly selling them on the streets. And I hear that they go for about $100, $150 a pill. So the doctors are writing the scripts, they're selling them, and then those people that are selling them on the streets uh, turning other people into addicts who then come into the ER because they're going through withdrawals. How does, how does something like 8,700 prescriptions get fall through the cracks? How does no one not notice that earlier? Because we're very busy in the ER and it takes time to check. A lot of, and I, I'm not be, I, I don't want to be unfair to my colleagues because I work with some wonderful physicians. We don't check all the time. When we're busy, and ERs are getting busier and busier and busier as primary doctors are retiring and saying, we're not doing this anymore, they come to the emergency room for primary care. 
doctors shut the patients out and say, listen, you know, I'm not prescribing any more for you. So they turn to the emergency room. And so they come in, we're overwhelmed, and there's a multitude of reasons. Patients will get right up in your face. There's the, 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 the lack of respect for physicians is, from when I started to now, is incredible. The things that teenagers will scream at us, and the parents are right there, and they don't even reprimand them that this is inappropriate. So they come in, and if they don't get what they want, they start yelling and screaming. And when you're handling emergencies, real emergencies, and the nurses are coming to you and say, John Smith in room whatever um, is you know, all upset and he's yelling and screaming, and you need to go see him right away, and you're taking care of a stroke patient or a heart attack or, or you know, an unstable septic patient, you go in the room and they're unrelenting sometimes it's easier just to write them the script and get them out of there, which is wrong. Every patient that comes in to the emergency room gets what's called a Prescani, a, a patient satisfaction survey and all of those are reported and every hospital in hospital emergency room which is in, uh, not considered in hospital that's a separate entity <clears throat> gets reported and they look at and they compare you to ERs around the country of similar size and the patients know that and I've had patients threaten me saying if you don't give me my Percocets I'm going to give you a bad Prescani and that's gonna go against the hospital. And uh, they write all these nasty notes, the doctor was rude, I didn't, I left in tremendous pain, and my pain scale wasn't addressed. And then the administration says, hey, we got this nasty Prescani and nasty letter about you. And you say, well, the person was a drug addict, it was drug seeking. Well, you know, just, you know, but, but now this goes against us and it's reportable. And if you go below a certain mark, the hospital doesn't get certain reimbursements for Medicare and Medicaid, it's a financial thing. So there are all these pressures from the patients, from the government, from the hospitals. So some of my colleagues are like, I don't need this. You wanna be a drug addict? Here's the script, go and, get, and, and go about your life. It's easier for some of them. I take a harder line, it's inappropriate, it's wrong, it's not why I went into medicine, I will not do it. And I've told hospital administrators, I'm sorry, you know, this is inappropriate and I will not practice medicine that way. We have to honestly say to our patients, it's okay to be uncomfortable. You have every right to be in pain. It's not my job to make you 100% pain free. That's part of the, the illness, part of the trauma, part of the disease. It's my job to help you heal, to diagnose you and treat you so that you can go on with a nice, healthy life. So actually, it's perfect timing because um, this weekend they messed up my bottles. So for some reason, when I got there Friday with my box, they told me that my bottles were revoked and I said, no, they're not. And so they, they messed up my bottles and I had to come on Saturday, but she didn't tell me that they closed at nine. 
and I had to uh, go the whole weekend without anything. How did that work out? <laughs> Not great. I felt pretty crappy by 12 o'clock on Saturday. What are the feelings? Um, the same kind of withdrawals that you would get, but even worse from uh, withdrawal from heroin. It's like sweats and um, stomach problems and, uh, you know, I wasn't able to sleep at all and it was just horrible. I work full time now. Um, I got an apartment that I'm moving into next month. I. Um, applied for uh, custody of my daughter and so now my daughter's father and I because she's been living there mainly have uh, shared residence so I get her more often we have joint custody legal and physical and we have um, shared residence so I get her during the week as well as well as every other weekend it's good it's, per it's great like that's the you know, the main reason that I wanted to get clean. In the beginning, uh, it's true, when I was using, I didn't see her a lot. Um, it's like drugs make it so that you don't feel those feelings. You're just completely blank. And it's almost like I didn't want to go there and then have her think that I was around. I didn't want her to think anything like um, I was just going to disappear again. I was always around in the area and stuff, but um, and, and went to holidays and things like that, but um, it was almost like I was afraid to be around. Like I, I, you know, I had so many people saying that or making me feel like I was a horrible mother that I actually thought that I was and I just wasn't around um, as much as I should have been. You know, she still gets worried sometimes like when she comes over. Um, like this weekend, I had to work on, on Sunday, and that night she was going to watch a movie with my parents downstairs, and I said I was just going go to go upstairs to go to bed because I had to get up in the morning. And she just started crying. She didn't want me to leave. She wanted me to be down there with her, and she ended up just coming upstairs with me because I think she still gets scared that, you know, and plus, you know, that's why I wanted more visitation, too. I just don't think she gets to see me enough. and. Uh, so I think sometimes she just gets scared that I'm not going to be around like before or something's going to happen like that. I'm super worried about my daughter's future. That's why I want her to be more in my presence too. And I, I never lie to her about what's going on. I, I told her, you know, everything about what, why I'm doing what I'm doing, you know, because she has two addict parents and you know, she is at a high risk of, you know, becoming an addict herself, and it just worries me. Uh, it would kill me if she did, and so I try to, you know, I want to tell her as much as possible what happens when, you be, when you're an addict to your life. So how long have, we, uh, have you been clean now? Um, a year. This. It was a year, September 14th, so it's like a year and a month now. All right, so this is the clinic. Some interesting characters. No, um, they fixed it. So when I went in there, she said, 
you know, you have a Saturday to take home, like I just got it. I'm like, no, I've always had a Saturday to take home, well, since I earned it. But, um, you, you know, they said it was a glitching computer that messed up my bottles, but, um, but it, I'm not stupid, somebody has to put that in. You know, I think sometimes they think I'm like an idiot like some of the other clients they have and you know, I'm far from it. I know that you have to put that in the computer. The computer doesn't just glitch up my bottles like a robot or something. So what's the procedure when you go inside? What do you need to do? Yeah, you just go in and scan your ID and they'll tell you if you have a urine or if you have to talk to your counselor that day. There, there's two different lines for people with bottles and people that are single dosing. And um, that's pretty much it. I mean, it's good in the beginning. You kind of need to go every day uh, when you're first getting clean, I think because you have access to uh, meetings there um, and you have access to counselors every day and it kind of keeps you more in line, you know. Um, and they can watch you, see how you're doing. Uh, you know, the nurses ask how you're doing and uh, in the beginning um, and you can go up on your dose so that you get to the point where you, um, you're not feeling bad anymore <clears throat> or not getting withdrawals during the day. Um, so they wanna get you to a, a, a good dose and then um, start you know, the, the bottles off so that you know, they know you're stable before they start doing that. I am getting the bottle uh, three days a week. Uh, I, I'm not even thinking about like coming off it. Um, you know, maybe eventually I, I will. Um, but people stay on it for a long period of time, years and years, or the rest of their life. And uh, so if I came off it, I knew I would know that I could get high on heroin again. And, uh, you know, I don't think that's a good thing. And I think, too, part of it is coming off of methadone is a lot harder than coming off of heroin. It's a longer lasting drug. And so it, it has worse withdrawals. It's really hard to come off of, um, which I guess is part of the risk. You know, I, I think that I've gained more than what I would get taken away from being on it, but um, it is hard to come off of. They, they, they wean you down though really, really slowly. Um, <laughs> off of it anyways so that's a benefit of that but it is hard to come off of and that's something that worries me is that I'm gonna feel crappy and I'm gonna get anxious about it and then I'm gonna just want to use to make sure that I'm okay I just hope that I show other addicts um, that are going through some of the things that I went through I was using um, <clears throat> the benefit of getting clean, whether they decide to go on methadone or not. Um, I like to show how well it helped me. Um, I, I was a chronic relapser. There just have been no other way than to do it this way for me. <laughs> I've learned and um, some people are actually really scared to get on it. They, they worry about the same, their, their biggest worry I've always found, which is it, it kind of is odd to me. Their biggest worry always has been, well, I'm going to have to be on it forever. I'm going to have to be on it for a long period of time. But it's like, yeah, you're going to be on it for a long period of time probably, but you're going to be stable. You're going to get your life back together. You're not going to have to commit the crimes that you are to get the drugs that you need every day. You know, you won't feel like crap every day. Um, and you could have a normal life clean, whether you're on it or not. You know, who, who cares if you have to be on it for a long period of time? You get to have a normal, clean life uh, on it. The, the outlook for where we're going on a 
serious, what I consider a serious public health crisis in the United States. We have now raised the issue. It is front and center. It's part of a national dialogue. What we need to do is to not just say we understand the problem, but what are we going to do to address it? This is occurring all over the United States, urban, rural. It is young people, older adults uh, who are facing this crisis. And we have veterans who are returning, who are uh, face these crises as well. What are we going to do about it? We need to act now that we have it on the front burner. We need to act and we need to act quickly. If I were to like say anything, definitely that drug, uh, doing drugs, it's not worth it. It's, I know it's just me saying this, but it's coming from experience. It's coming from my life completely turning around to seeing what life actually is. Like, I was all alone thought drugs made me a completely different person. I wasn't myself who I am right now. So it you can completely flip your life around just a, like it's not a small change. It's probably one of the biggest changes you can make. Well, I just want to be able to move on and have a, just like a normal low-key life of an adult. I want to be able to have my own place. I want to, uh, you know, be able to have my my daughter and uh, go to work. And it just sounds, you know, crazy to all the these people that are that's their normal life now. But you know, just to be able to have that would be, you know, great. I hadn't um, ever been taught in school about addiction or what happens and. I, I want to be able to go around to schools and be able to talk to kids in high school and tell them, you know, what happens when you get addicted and all the things that I had that I had lost. And um, uh, I want to tell them, you know, everything that's involved with it. And I, I think if I knew that, that's definitely something that I would have, you know, stayed away from. We're all accountable. The patients the facilitators of the patients, the administrators putting pressure on the physicians to keep the patients happy so they get good surveys are accountable. Everybody is. And until society wants to take a step back and say, enough, we're going to work together, it's not going to get solved. And it's a shame.